And good morning. It looks like it's 11 o'clock straight up, so we'll uh, get this underway. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin Peckham. I'm the handsome guy on the left there uh, with the graying hair. Uh, I'm your uh, moderator today. That means actually I'm the guy who's going to introduce our uh, distinguished uh, presenter uh, who you see on the right side of the screen. And I'll hang around for the end to uh, help pose the questions that you write in about. Uh, and uh, I hope you have tuned into the right webinar. We're going to talk about uh, uh, Neutrix EtherCon family. In fact, we're going to talk about uh, Ethernet in, in general a fair bit and uh, I guarantee there'll be some uh, material presented that uh, you know but also a lot of material you've never seen before and a lot of fresh mat fresh material but before we do that uh, a few housekeeping things uh, we uh, we have a question feature that's built into the go to meeting uh, facility that we use here uh, that allows you to ask questions just type them in you can do that anytime during the presentation I won't be interrupting uh, Fred in the presentation for those but at the end of it we'll be accumulating those and uh, I will then uh, consolidate the questions and pose those to Fred so we can get answers for you. Also, um, in case you are called away midstream or if uh, if the presentation is something you think your coworkers or associates would be interested in, uh, we record all of these and uh, they are then made available for future viewing uh, and you can find those on the FTW uh, website. So uh, uh, certainly uh, pass along information to others that would benefit from seeing the material presented. And then uh, for our benefit, and uh, we appreciate you doing it, please hang around at the end of the presentation long enough to do the survey and uh, that will appear as you attempt to exit the webinar. If you do that, that helps us uh, kind of fine tune these webinars and keep them uh, uh, highly applicable to uh, the kinds of things you're interested in. It's also a great opportunity for you to type in a topic that you would like us to explore. So uh, that feedback is very useful. Now, having those things out of the way, uh, let's meet Fred. Uh, Fred is a fellow that uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing quite some time here. He's been uh, uh, by and kind enough to do some uh, technical training here at Full Compass, not only for our customers, but for our in-house sales staff. Uh, and uh, in, in Neutrix line, it's a, as everybody who knows anything about Neutrix knows, it's a very vast line of interconnectivity. But uh, the way the world is going these days with the digital interconnects for audio and video, everything in the world of AV is undergoing change. Uh, I think it's uh, very common these days to pick up a trade magazine and hear somebody talking about, gee, one of these days we're only going to need uh, Ethernet connectors, and RJ45s. Well, uh, I think it's a good thing that uh, we have something better than just the plain old-fashioned uh, garden variety RJ45 to interconnect professional applications with. So today we're going to talk about uh, that RJ45 in the EtherCon format, which is a wonderful uh, professional interconnect uh, methodology for it. And Fred's the right person to talk about. So uh, Fred, uh, let me bring you online here. Fred is a, a very distinguished, uh, knowledgeable person in this uh, in this capacity, but uh, he is also a, a musician and has a lot of real-world experience using these things. So he's uh, not somebody who just knows how to make them. He knows how to use them as well. Fred, if you're there, uh, sign on here and I'll uh, get you started. I sure am. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. Thank you to FDW. Um, I'm Fred Morgenstern. I've been with Nortrick USA for a little bit more than nine years. I've done tech support for the company for about seven and a half years. So if you've called in to get some uh, some help with your products over that period of time, it's almost certainly been me that you've spoken with. I'm the one person here in the U.S. who, who handles that. So please keep calling in with your questions and your problems because that, that keeps me employed. So let's move on to the next slide. We'll talk about the, the topics we're going to cover here. There's a, a huge amount, and we're going to skim through some of it. We'll talk quickly about Neutrik, then we're going to talk about why even bother with something like EtherCon rather than just using standard RG45s. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different topics within the EtherCon world, as you can see there. Um, if we have time, we'll look at a few uh, solutions which are not EtherCon, which we also offer, which are also rugged solutions. And I'll, I'll make sure we have some time for questions and answers. So let's move on to the slide, who is Neutrik? I'm going to assume that you know who Neutrik is. We are the company that invents all of this stuff. We invented the printed circuit board mount um, XLR connector. We invented EtherCon. We invented PowerCon. We invented SpeakCon. We invented OpticalCon. We invent all of these different connectors that are used in the AV industry. Uh, we are the, the, the leader in innovation, and we're also the leader in quality. Based in Liechtenstein, we have some remote factories as well, but um, Swiss machinery for robotics, very highly trained workforce, the best materials that we can use. Um, I don't think I need to sell Neutrik to anyone who's a professional in the industry. Uh, it is, in my opinion, uh, the best of the breed, and, and the longer that I work here, the truth is, the more respect I have for Neutrik as a company and as a manufacturing facility, as an engineering organization, it's, it's top notch in every way. Um, so let's talk about uh, EtherCon. Why EtherCon? Um, well, the first thing, the first question is, you know, why not just create a whole new connector? In this case, we said, well, let's 
leverage the economy of scale that comes from these standard IT data connectors. There's no way that in the AV industry, as tiny as we are, we could come up with connectors that would be nearly as cost effective as these RG45s. Um, but the problem with RG45s, as I try to show in that uh, photo up on the top, is they're just not stable. You can trip over them, you can kick them out, and that's fine in an installed AV environment where the risk of that happening is low and you just plug it back in. But if you're running a, a show, if there's a band playing, if there's a, a musical, that's absolutely unacceptable. So um, the concept from Neutrik was, let's take these RG45s, which, which are known to be working, and let's ruggedize them in a metal shell and a good uh, strain relief, which holds the cable well. Let's have it latch in. Um, and this idea has been uh, universally adopted in audio and in video as well. It's, it's, it's just a great approach. You can always plug a standard RG45 into the sockets, uh, but at the same time, uh, if you want that ruggedness, if you want to be sure that someone won't kick out a cable um, or one won't accidentally dislodge, uh, that's what EtherCon is for. Uh, so let's talk about some more reasons for EtherCon on the next slide. Uh, one is that you get weather resistance. We're going to talk a lot about weather resistance. Um, with the standard RG45, you just don't have that. If you're doing a show outdoors or in some sort of polluted environment, that can be a problem. Um, these EtherCon housings minimize damage to the cable connectors. Um, they provide the guidance of the cable connectors to move them in and out of the, of the socket. And by providing that alignment, they extend the life of the sockets and the, the RG45 plugs as well. So um, it's, a, it's a when you need that ruggedness, EtherCon's there for you. When you don't need it, well, that's you know it's overkill. Um, but we're talking about this audio video environment where it's certainly necessary. So let's move on and let's try to get a sense for where we stand now in the twisted pair world, the Ethernet world. Um, when we look at the category cables that are currently in use, there's basically really uh, four. There's Cat 5e cable, and what I want you to see as you look at this up at the top is notice the twists. There are not so many twists here compared to Cat 6. See how Cat 6 has many more twists? This is twisted pair technology. You know, for all of you who are involved in balanced audio, you understand the, the concept of noise reduction from twisted pairs. Um, the Cat 5e cables don't need to twist very much because they're not operating at very high frequencies. But when you get to Cat 6 cables, they have to really twist much more because the frequencies are higher, so they need to be able to, to um, have a tighter twist to reject um, these higher frequencies, which have shorter wavelengths, uh, to, re to reject that noise from coming into the cable. Um, when we move to CAT 6A cabling, I really honestly wish that they had called CAT 6A CAT 7 because you see it's so different. You've got more twists, and then you've got this um, this barrier in the middle, which is keeping all the twisted pairs away from one another at a defined distance, so you don't have crosstalk between the pairs. Um, then finally, uh, in our industry, we're seeing more and more CAT 7. CAT7 does away with that uh, that barrier that CAT6A has, but CAT7 adds shielding for every twisted pair as well as an outer shield. So you can see that as we keep moving forward, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, to do everything we can to shield that cable from from alien signals coming in. On the next slide, what I try to do is is talk again about these frequencies. So um, the CAT5V cables work at up to 100 megahertz frequency. We'll talk about how you get from megahertz to to, to uh, to, to bit rates. Um, CAT6 cable goes up to 250 megahertz, CAT6A up to 500 megahertz, CAT7 a little bit higher. Um, but what really matters here with these, uh, with these frequencies is you take the frequency, you do some encoding on a wire pair, which gets you more voltages per cycle, uh, um, more different values per cycle. Then you have four twisted pairs, so multiply that all by four, and that's how you can get up to these, these higher, uh, up to the, the data rate in gigabits. So the, the megahertz is how quickly the electrons are moving. The gigabits is once all of those uh, frequencies are collected and voltages are collected on the other side and, and added together from the twisted pairs, that's when you wind up with the data rate. So you see CAT5e is going to get you up to one gig of data. CAT6 was the major improvement, which got you up to 10 gigs of data, but at a limited distance. CAT6a with that um, additional twisting with that higher speed, with um, with the barrier in the middle, allows you to get up to a whole 100 meters of length. And CAT7 will also get you up to an entire 100 meters of length with, with slightly better shielding. So the real distinction in our world is CAT5e, one gig, perfectly sufficient, perfectly sufficient for audio, absolutely. Uh, it's used some for HD base T and for some uh, video that, that may have some compression. Once you have uncompressed video, once you're doing um, a mixture of video plus audio plus maybe control plus some other things, that's when you move into the CAT6 or the CAT6A world. 
Um, that's the um, that's really the distinction if you're trying to think about that. If you're in the Dante world on audio, you're very comfortably in Cat 5e. Uh, if you're again, if you're transmitting high def video on compressed, you you want to be in the Cat 6 world. So let's move on and let's take a look at the Nordic Ethercon families, which which map onto these cable types. So our first Ethercon family was Cat 5. It's still there. It's still our biggest seller. Uh, then we came out with a family for Cat 6, and uh, more recently, just a couple of years ago, a family for Cat 6a. Um, we'll talk about the, the decisions to make amongst these. So um, on the next slide, you see this whole issue of um, <laughs> is the RJ45 included? Is the RJ45 not included? It's kind of a, a confusing world. In our Cat5 Ethercon for our cable carriers, you add your own RJ45. We're really just providing this this rugged housing, chuck type strain relief, good boot. Um, but on Cat6 and Cat6A, we include our own RJ45 with these, so you don't need to have one. And when you look at these parts, you say, well, oh my goodness, how come the Cat6A is so much more expensive than the Cat5? Well, one reason is that the Cat6A connector has an RJ45, whereas the Cat5 does not. Let's um let's move on here and take a look at the the timeline of these three families. So, as I said, Cat5 was our original line introduced in 2001. Um, here we see the bit rates again uh, down at the bottom. Cat6 uh, we introduced around 2008, and Cat6A in 2015. We're going to talk about the the confusion that this can cause because now you've got all these different options. Ugh, it's almost better not to have to have more options. But the the bottom line is, as I will say a number of times through this discussion. Uh, if you're in CAT6 world, if you've moved up to that 10 gig world, uh, choose the CAT6A connectors. They're really better in, in practically every way than the CAT6 connectors are, and they're less expensive. Uh, the CAT6A family really is the latest and greatest. Uh, but having said that, if you only need CAT5 data rates, you don't need to spend the money for CAT6A. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide here. There's always this question of, well, how can I tell which Ethercon family it is? And it's actually pretty easy once you know it. Um, the Ethercon CAT6 connectors include uh, CAT6. I'm sorry, in the, here I say it includes C6, I should say. It includes CAT6 uh, on the, the uh, chassis connector. The cable connector does not have an identification. Um, uh, but I'm sorry, the part number includes C6. So the chassis connector says CAT6, the part number will include C6. On the next slide, you'll see CAT6A, Ethercon CAT6A. Um, and for Ethercon CAT6A, you will always see on the part numbers both the excuse me, both the chassis connectors and the cable connectors, C6A, pretty clear. That's CAT6A. And the part numbers always include X6 in those part numbers. Then when we look at Ethercon CAT5, this one's kind of easy now that you know the trick, which is that this one doesn't have any identification saying what it is. So since it doesn't say what it is, it must be CAT5. Um, we have this Ethercon CAT6A line. This is on the next slide. And there's always this question, well, you know, why do we have this little a? And this is really sort of a confusing problem. It's 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 unfortunate. We I'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide. Um uh, so let, let's move on one 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 slide down. Yeah. Um you know typically all of these norms are international <clears throat> between EIA, TIA and, and ISO standards. But when it came to CAT 6A, there was this massive uh disagreement between basically the Americans and the Europeans and they were not able to harmonize the standards, which is very rare. So the U.S. standard is CAT6A with a standard A. The international standard is CAT6A with a subscripted A. And the difference is that the European standard is more rigid, especially when it comes to uh, to crosstalk. So um, the CAT6A standard, which is the European standard, is higher performing than, than the American standard. You don't really need to worry about this. Just know that when you uh, choose Ethercon, you're choosing the highest possible CAT6A standard. Um, that will perform better than the American standard. In the real world, does this make a difference? Probably not much, but but it is enough of a difference that the standards did deviate for CAT 6A. Um, okay, let's talk about intermating these families. And by the way, this is the the number one tech support request or call that we get, and it's the most tragic because it happens after people have already done an install and then they find out that Ethercons are not mating. I'll get a call and people say, I've got these Ethercon connectors, they don't mate. And I know, I know that it's because one of the connectors is CAT6 and one of the other connectors is either CAT5 or CAT6A. So in our history, we came up with CAT5, then we came up with CAT6 with a different mechanism. And we had to do it both for technical reasons and also because we thought people would be happy to have a, a, a distinctly different mechanism for a distinctly different network type. And some people are happy with it. But of course, people that don't know and they think that they can just intermate everything 
um, you know, wind up having uh, conflicts, which cannot be resolved. You cannot resolve this problem. That, uh, the CAT6 and the CAT5 and the CAT6A will not intermate. So when we came up with the CAT6A system, we went back down to the same geometry we used for CAT5. So now we have a situation where um, really we could probably say we, if whatever you're, is not going to make you happy, we offer that. <laughs> you know, if you want incompatibility because you don't want to mix your networks, well, we have compatibility between CAT5 and CAT6A. If you want everything to be able to plug in all the time, well, that's not an option as well. So let's go down to the next slide. We'll take a look a little bit um, clearer at, at the differences here. You see for CAT5 and CAT6A, there's a latch on the chassis connector, and there's no latch on that CAT6 chassis connector. And you also see when you look at the, at the cable connectors that that CAT6 cable connector is very different. It's got a push-pull mechanism rather than have that slot on the top and the, and the latch mechanism. So that's why, why they won't integrate. I want to give you a visual which is going to keep you from ever making the mistake of, of intermating CAT5, CAT6, and CAT6A, and that's on the next slide. You've got CAT5 and CAT6A, pretty little kitties. They like to play with one another. CAT6, watch out. Uh, before you install CAT6, really think about it and know what you're doing because CAT6 will bite you unless, again, you you have decided that you want to use CAT6 specifically and you know what the parts are and, and, and you're aware of the incompatibilities. All right, let's, let's take a look at the, the prices of these, uh, of these different um, options. So this is where I said you don't want to over-spec if all you need is CAT5, if all you're doing is an audio network. You may want to feature-proof with your cabling, you know, run CAT6 or CAT6A cabling through your conduit uh, in an install situation. But if you know it's going to be an audio network, if you know you're not going to uh, exceed that requirement, you're going to save some significant money using CAT5. So um, uh, let's just kind of walk through these. Uh, if we look at the um, the punch down or IDC versions of the of the chassis connectors, you see CAT5 is about 950. This, this is MSRP. Your prices will be lower. Um, CAT6 is about $28. CAT6A is about $17. So you've got a big difference there. Uh, and then when we look at the cable carriers, I'm just going to skip past the feed through. If you look at the cable carriers, um, you know, 315 for that CAT5, 1110 for the NE8, uh, for the CAT6, and about uh, 1450 for the CAT6A. So the total cost I put down here at the bottom, and you can see where, especially for CAT6 versus CAT6A, CAT6A is, again, higher performing than CAT6. It's, it's compatible down to CAT5 if you wanted to use those those cable connectors, um, there's a very strong argument here for using uh, CAT6A over, over CAT6. Um, let, let's move on and, and let's look at this, again, the, this whole issue of should I choose EtherCon CAT6 or should I choose EtherCon CAT6A? Uh, again, CAT6A is downward compatible to CAT5. It offers the full 10 gigs at up to 100 meters rather than up to 33 to 55 meters. It's less expensive as the system, easier to terminate. You can use a wider range of cables. You've got a, a whole lot of different options here uh, that, that are in favor of EtherCon CAT6A. On the next slide, I try to say, well, you know, what's the argument in favor of CAT6? So for that, you can purchase pre-terminated cable assemblies from us. That's nice. Um, you can use thinner cable, which is less expensive. Um, and if you want that unique geometry so that you do not intermate um, accidentally with a CAT5 or a CAT6A network, you've got it. Some people like that unique geometry so that that... Um, accidental intermating will not happen. Uh, also, it's a little strange to say that it's an, it might be an advantage that there's no coupler, but uh, it is certainly the case that we have people who couple and couple and couple cables, and then they call up and say, hey, things aren't working because they've just put too many passive couples in the system, too many connectors, too long a cable, and eventually the, the system just can't handle it. So since you can't couple, you don't need to worry about um, you know someone making that, that mistake of, of trying to go too far. Okay, so that's some about the three EtherCon families. Let's talk spe specifically about what's new. And there's some things here which uh, might surprise you. So um, the first thing is that we have obsoleted all of the NE8MC cable connectors. This is a big deal. These have been around since, again, 2001, 18 years. Um, we have replaced them all with NE8MX cable connectors. So um, what I try to show here in this graphic is uh, if you have – put these things together before in the past, you know you've got these little guidance pieces and the most recent iteration has those uh, white, gray, and black pieces that I show here, but we've had other iterations that have had little C-clips, different things. And it's always fiddly. If you've got big hands like me, it's always a bit of a pain to deal with. The NE8MX connectors get rid of all that stuff and put all that guidance right into that chuck. So 
the, the chuck type strain relief is molded in order to hold the RG45 directly. It means you've got fewer pieces. Assembly is much faster, much easier, much more foolproof. Uh, so it's really, it's a great upgrade. There is still some NE8MC stock out there in the world, in the wild. If for some reason you love that connector, buy it now. Because like I said, we have obsolete it as of, I believe, uh, January. Um, and we are we will not make any more. The new NE8MX is, is uh, really terrifically better. Um, the next uh, slide shows these um, cable carriers. So you can see um, it's the four that you're used to. If you know the uh, Ethercon cable carrier world, the, the nickel ones and the black ones and the, the dash one for uh, cables that do not yet have RJ45s on them. And then there's a new one here, which is it's NE8MX-TOP right in the center. Uh, and this TLP line uh, stands for True Outdoor Protection. It's IP65 rated when mated, and it's also uh, UV resistant. So in this case, the, the boot is UV resistant. We'll, we'll talk about that much more as we come up. Um, on the next slide, uh, not exactly so new, but we have a new uh, coupler for Ethercon CAT 6A, which is this NE8FFX6-W on the right-hand side. Again, IP65 rated, very compact. Um, it also can be used for CAT5. So we have people who want to uh, mate uh, they want to couple cat5 together as they have done for years and years with this ne8 ff which is on the left but they want some weather resistance okay well in that case they can use their standard ne8 mc or ne8 mx cable carriers and use this new coupler on the right hand side and they can have weather resistance uh, which is which is helpful for those outdoor environments um some people ask well do you have an ethercon cable jack uh rather than just the plug we do not so if you need that jack, then you know use one of these couplers and, and leave the other side open for for that uh, that jack position. Okay. Also, what's new is uh, as I mentioned, this top series true outdoor protection. Uh, this gets you to IP65 um, and uh, has these these UV ratings. What we'll we'll talk about this coming up some more. Uh, the next thing which I wish people knew more about is these Ethercon Cat 6A cable connector. Retermination kits. So, for some reason, you want to reuse that cable connector, you can purchase just this component and stick it into your uh, into your cable carrier. So, nice option, good to know about, and um, we don't sell enough of them. I think because people don't know about them, people are still buying full connectors when they could purchase these retermination kits and save some money. So, hopefully, that will help you to know. All right, let's move on and look at assembly. So, here's some. Uh, again, because I do all the tech support for the U.S., I keep hearing all, all these horror stories. <laughs> all the horror stories come to me, so I'm, I'm here to, to help you through all of them. First of all, when you're using these cable carriers, choose an a, approved or a known good RJ45. So we have a list of what we approve, but at the same time, FDW has been selling Ethercon for years and years. They, I, I assume, have an associated sell of RG45, so you can speak with them and say, well, hey, what, what RG45s do you recommend? What do you know is good? That'll be fine. Um, but there are some, uh, the RG45 standard is is not tight, and there are some RG45s which simply will, will not fit into our housing. So, um, you know, be aware of that. The next note, which is crucially important, is remember that when you're mating that cable connector into that chassis connector, it is the metal that's doing the mating. It's not that little locking plastic tab right? So if you don't snap off that tab, and people don't, and I actually had a call about this, uh, just it must have been late last week, you know, someone's trying to release his, trying to pull his cable out and couldn't do it because that RG45 was snapped in there as well. So he had to pull and yank and yank and yank, and that's that's no good. It will probably work, but of course it's going to wear down the components. Um, and it's it's a, that's a, that's a very common error, which you really need to avoid. So just be sure you cut off that tab uh, so that it's only the outer housing that's doing the doing the locking. I have a couple notes about um, Cat 6A as well, um, and this is on the next slide. the The most important thing about this about terminating these connectors, both the IDC uh, chassis connectors and also the cable connectors, is you must and I must. I'm not a real <laughs> adamant guy, but in this case, you must use a parallel press plier with a smooth jaw. You can understand how when you're pressing down on that block, if you've got a diagonal plier, that diagonal plier is going to press more on one side, and it's probably not going to get the other side too well. And if you then flip those around, well, you might get both sides, but you're not going to get the middle so well. And if you've got a, a parallel plier, that, a plier that's got serrated jaws, well, that serration is also not going to make an even crimp. So you need to have a smooth jawed parallel press plier. Now, we sell a part, HX-CAT-6A, which, which is basically this NIPEX part number. 
Um, you can save money by purchasing the NipX part number. And so I give it to you here. Just buy it as that. Um, it's around $50. It's not uh, too terribly expensive. It's worth having. Uh, and if not that, then something similar when you're doing this, this uh, CAT 6 a termination. Uh, very important. Very important. Okay, so let's talk about outdoor use, and I'm going to try to whip through a bunch of this. Um, the first thing is to remember what I talk about, the IP ratings, what, what IP ratings mean. IP stands for ingress protection, and it's a set of two digits. The first digit has to do with, um, with particles. The most important particle is your fingers. So a level of, of IP2 is pretty important for connectors because you don't want to get your finger in there, especially if it's going to be you know high voltage or, or a high power type of connector. Um, and this moves all the way up through dust protection, IP5, um, dust tightness, and all this has to do. Uh, all of this is very clearly defined of the size of the particles, how uh, high, the, how the velocity that they use to blow them, etc. So the first digit is solid particles. The second digit, which is on the next page, is uh, liquids and uh, for liquids you can imagine that as you you know keep moving up you can handle uh, more and more water uh, once you get past six you get into immersion uh, being able to actually uh, leave a connector underwater we have very few connectors that do that we don't do it in ethercon because we don't really see a, a point where in AV we're going to be submerging these connectors uh, if the equipment wouldn't be able to handle it all right so let's just keep that in mind the most important uh, IP ratings are IP 42 IP54 and IP65, uh, and you're going to see that here on a, a bunch of these slides as we go forward. So um, when we look at these IP ratings, uh, CAT5 can uh, be IP54, which is dust protected, or it can be IP65, which is dust tight. CAT6 is always IP65. CAT6A can be up to IP65. Um, let's move on and take a look at the next slide here. And again, you, you'll be able to uh, when this is posted, you'll be able to pause the presentation and see what's going on. So um, we see we you have some sealing kits for Cat5, uh, which will uh, which you can retrofit a connector with to get you up to this uh, uh, this level of protection. Uh, for the Cat6A connectors, choose the parts that have a dash W in them. And dash W in, in Neutric uh, terminology typically means um, weather resistance. Um, okay, the next slide shows. Some of these options here that you can purchase here is the SE8FD. This is a sealing Ethernet 8 conductor female D size. You can uh, retrofit with this kit uh, to get you IP54. Uh, the next kit, which we have on the next page, is SE8FD-TOP, which will get you IP65. And so this is our, our latest and greatest sealing. Um, you can purchase the connectors which already have the sealing kit on it, or you can retrofit a, a connector with, with one of these in order to... to uh, to be prepared for, for outdoor or polluted environments. Uh, all right, so for CAT6, everything is always IP65. That's the next slide. Um, this is easy in this regard. It's a very small product line. Everything is always at IP65. And then the next slide, we talk about CAT6A. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Still on CAT6. Um, be aware that this CAT6 cable connector is tough to terminate. If you've done a lot of shielded RG45 termination, it's not too bad. But if you haven't, it's a bit of a pain in the neck. Um, and for that reason, we do have pre-terminated cable assemblies uh, that are available for you to purchase. And those, uh, as, we, as I'm trying to show on the bottom of the slide, you see that we sell those cable assemblies with the Ethercon cable uh, carrier on both sides, rugged on both sides, and also a different option where you've got the Ethercon cable carrier on one side and a standard shielded RG45 on the other. So uh, these are some options for you. Okay, the next page I talk about, uh, or we're showing the um, dash W chassis connectors for IP protection for CAT6A. Um, and uh, if you if you move on, we'll just uh, take a look here in those notes that, uh, again, C6A is clearly written on all these CAT6A chassis connectors. Note the four screw holes here. Um, this is unusual for a D-size connector. If you want to uh, have a good seal here, you've got to um, apply four screw holes, uh, uh, four screws, to be sure that you you really screw that that front flange down well. Uh, the next page, um, I show some of our various different protection covers. These are all popular. Um, the SCCD-W is, is a big, massive hinged thing, uh, which is doing doing extremely well for us. So if you really want to have that good outdoor protection, that's a that's a nice option to have. Um, and then there's a cable cap, which almost nobody purchases, and as far as I'm concerned, almost no one should purchase. But uh, just uh, if you're one of those people who wants ultimate protection, just be aware that this is also available. 
All right, so let's take a look at the sizes and the termination options that are available for you. And again, I really do want to uh, focus this presentation more toward the installers. You know, uh, well, I'll talk a tiny bit for the, the manufacturers of equipment, but really this is for installers. So, um, you know, we have this D size flange. I'm not sure you know this D size flange. That's the rectangular flange that you see on Cat 5, Cat 6, and Cat 6A here. Um, Cat 6 and Cat 6A are only available with this D size flange. Cat 5 has got some smaller uh, options as well. But typically, when you're having panels made, you're going to have them cut out with, that, with those D size cutouts. So uh, all of these lines will work for you this way. On the next page, we um, uh, we take a look at your termination styles available in the in the D size. IDC is available for Cat 5, Cat 6, and Cat 6A. Feed through, which is the most popular option by far, is available only in Cat 5 and Cat 6A. Uh, and then there's PCB mounting, which is available just for Cat 5. Um, on the next page, I just kind of briefly mentioned the SKUs to get you a sense for this. So um, look at the Cat 6 uh, column. There's only two SKUs, right? In Cat 5, we have dozens and dozens of different SKUs. And in Cat 6A, uh, we have a total of uh, of, of, of six different um, six different chassis kinds of parts. Uh, so, okay, let's look at Ethercon Cat 6. You've only got one termination style, it's IDC, that's it. And you can get it in nickel or black. It's a very simple line, it's only those two parts. Next page, we have Ethercon Cat 6A. Uh, and here the big issue is P6, which means pass through, Y6, which means IDC termination. Uh, and then when we look at the suffixes, dash B is black and dash W is weather resistant. Now let's move on and take a look at Ethercon Cat 5. So um, the most popular parts by far in the Ethercon Cat 5 line are these feed through parts. You can feed through right from the back, uh, or you can come kind of come up from the bottom of the back with the dash R, which is a right angle part. That's a newer part for us, which um, uh, will be helpful for you when when you have uh, when you really need to save space behind the panel. Um, the next subset of parts we have is uh, the IDC or punch down parts. Um, you know, there, there are two different blades in use. In the U.S., we typically use the 110 blade, uh, and in Europe, they typically use what's called the Crone blade. Uh, we almost never use the Crone blade in the U.S. Um, Use the, uh, you'll almost always choose the, the 110 version. Uh, also, by the way, to make a point here, be careful when you're looking at these parts on the internet. When I Google these, almost all of the images for the Chrome part that come up are wrong. So uh, th these images are right. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have PCB mounting. We're just going to whip through these real quick. Um, I think you can move on the next page, next page, next page. Um, and finally, let's wind up at, what do we want to wind up here? I don't want to spend too much time on this. Just kind of keep going through. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Yes, I've, my presentation is is too long. Okay, so let's talk about Ethercon shielding. This is important. Um, shielding, unfortunately, is an overloaded word. So the cable has a shield on it, if it's a STP, shielded twist pair cable. And the question is, is that shield passed through the connector to the, to the other side? And the answer with, with Ethercon is always yes. Um, but connectors can also be shielded. This means something different. So um, let's take a look here at the next page just very quickly. I'll show a, a shielded twisted pair cable, STP cable, and an unshielded twisted pair cable, UTP, unshielded twisted pair. Uh, on the next uh, page, we show the RG45s that go with these. So the shielded twisted pair requires a metal RG45 because that metal is what actually transmits that, that shield signal as we go forward. So you can see the, the metal RG45 on the top for the shielded pair, pair and the unshielded uh, RG45 on the bottom for the unshielded twisted pair. Um, on the next page, you kind of see how this rolls, therefore, into cable assembly. So here you see a cable assembly that's got a shielded RG45 and one with a non-shielded RG45. Um, okay, so on the next page comes really this important point. All Neutric, Neutric Ethercon chassis connectors and couplers, all of them, 100% of them, provide continuity on that cable shield. We will pass that cable, cable shield all the time don't worry about it. You want to use a shielded twist pair cable? Great, we're going to pass that shield signal. You don't want to use a shielded twist pair cable? That's great too. There will be no sig signal to pass, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but you never need to worry about that here. Um, but the problem here is that there's also such a thing as a shielded connector. So let's move on to the next page, and we'll we'll talk about this. So here you see uh, I'm pointing the arrows to where uh, continuity is made to that metal RG45 and how we pass that shield signal from the front to the back of the connector. So this connector is passing the shield. However, this is not a fully shielded connector. Let's move on to the next page. We'll, we'll see the difference. So here, look on the left. 
Again, this connector is going to pass a shield, but it's not a shielded connector. The one on the right is a shielded connector. A fully shielded connector means one which is entirely encased in metal. This is very, very confusing. Uh, let, we'll take a look at this some more on the next page. So here on the next page, that connector on the top is a fully shielded connector. Those EtherCon Cat5 connectors in the middle row are not fully shielded. You can tell they're not encased in metal. That doesn't mean that they won't pass a shield signal. They will. They'll work great. There's no problem. But now, now let's look at the bottom row. Once we get to EtherCon Cat6 and Cat6A, and remember, these are operating at frequencies of 250 megahertz to 500 megahertz rather than 100 megahertz for uh, Cat5. They're transmitting a lot more data a lot faster. These are, will always be shielded because the risk of interference becomes too high once we get up to these higher frequencies and higher data rates. The risk of interference is much lower when we're at the, at the Cat5e style data rates. And that's why if you wanted a fully shielded connector for Cat5, the only time we offer it is for these PCB mount connectors because those are going to fit inside a piece of active equipment. That active equipment might have a, a whole bunch of interference going on in it. Um, so we want to we want to protect the signal there, um, but again, out in the rack panel, it's, it's it's really typically not an issue. I talk about that a little bit on on the next slide, which we can probably just skip through. It. You know, when do you need to fully seal the EtherCon connector? Basically, you you, you don't really. Um, the EtherCon cable connector carriers, and on the cable side, will make an electrical connection to a shielded RG45, and so they will uh, provide some additional uh, some additional shielding as opposed to just using a standard. A shielded RG45. So that's another advantage to EtherCon is is protection of that uh, of that that shielded signal. Um, all right, let's uh, move on and let's talk about the cable connectors. Um, the next slide after this. Um, again, we have these um, Cat5 cable connectors. We actually call them cable connector carriers because they're carrying the RG45 which you provide. Uh, we talked a little bit about these five different parts before. Um, on the next slide, I show the discontinued NE8MC parts. So again, if you've been working with EtherCon at all uh, over the last many years, you're aware of these parts, which, which uh, we have just discontinued. Um, the next slide shows this NE8MC-MC6-MO. This is the uh, connector for CAT6. The dash MO, by the way, stands for Molex because this includes a Molex RG45 within this. Um, and then uh, the EtherCon CAT6A uh, cable connectors on the next page. Um, which uh, the, the trick here is that we have a nickel part and a black part, we, and then we have a dash T option. Well, what does the dash T mean? The dash T is for, stands for tiny in Neutric uh, nomenclature, and that's for cable where the insulation diameter of every particular wire is less than or equal to 1.1 millimeter. That is a small wire insulation, wire insulation diameter. So again, that's the wire. You've got eight wires of the, of the, within the cable. That's the insulation diameter surrounding that wire. So check your uh, your cable manufacturer's data sheet and use the standard part or the dash T part uh, appropriately in that regard. Um, I'm going to uh, take a break now and see, uh, before I move on, and, and, and see, uh, Kevin, if there's some questions for me to answer, because I don't want to run out of time without answering those questions. Yeah, that's fine. We did get a couple of questions, and uh, some of these I think you have just touched on, so uh, we might be backing up here, but we'll go through them anyway. Uh, first of all, there was a question about uh, why the decision not to make a female, or why, why not a jack uh, of the cable termination type uh, for EtherCon. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, the first answer for that, and it's also similar to our speak on in our PowerCon, is we want to make it easy. When you provide too many different options, well, then somebody, you know, rolls up with a cable and they want to plug it in, but it turns out that there's some sort of different gender, some sort of problem. Um, so that would that would be a, a problem. And also, you know, we're following the sort of the standard paradigm for um, how RJ45s are used. You've got sockets which would sit on equipment and sit on panels and sit on walls, and you've got uh, plugs which are on the cable end. So um, we do once in a while get a request for a jack. We're not going to make one because the requests are so infrequent. Uh, but again, as I discussed, the the coupler. It's bulky and it's expensive, but it can sit on the end of the cable to, to provide that jack option. That's a that's a good question, and I hope that that answer is um uh, is is, uh, is understandable. You know, I hope you can be somewhat sympathetic to that answer. That's a sure, good makes sense. Then yep. uh, the, next uh, the next question has to do with power over Ethernet. Is there anything about power over Ethernet that uh, dictates a preference for one of these connectors? That is a great question. Yeah. So, uh, and I really should have put that in here as well. In the same way that all EtherCom will um, pass a shield signal from an STP cable, 
100% of Ethicon connectors and uh, on the cable side and the chat side will do that. It is also the case that all uh, Ethercon uh, connectors are PoE plus compliant, and that's to, I want to say, 802.3 AT. Uh, but <laughs> if you if you want to know for sure, you know, check the website and uh, or or contact me, and I can I can review that for the, the particular cases. Um, in that regard, all Ethercon is basically equivalent to all other Ethercon. There's no advantage to choosing one family or one connector over any other family or any other connector. You're going to be you're going to be good to go with PoE. Um, uh, with with all of our different options, I, I'm I'm very glad that question came up because it does remind me next time I I rejigger this uh, this presentation I, I I need to include that in there. Good question. Um, and then uh, uh -huh. the slide that showed the uh, Cat five E and the six six uh, A and the uh, Cat seven did not show any current uh, Ethercon uh, solutions for Cat seven. Is that correct? Uh, also, great question. Yeah. So, um, where we mostly see Cat7 is uh, with uh, Crestron. They they are using a Cat7 cable. Uh, there is actually no such thing as a Cat7 connector system. So, uh, the the only thing that's reasonable is connect the Cat7 cable to Ethercon Cat6 or Ethercon Cat6A. And again, typically our recommendation is use Ethercon Cat6A. So, uh, Cat7 is really a it's a cable set of technologies, the cable construction device as opposed to um, uh, cables plus connectors. So uh, use our CAT 6A. When and you're I think using this Cat is related cable, to, things work just perfectly. Yep. the same question because it came from the same fellow. The uh, uh, the size of the conductors, the size of the jacket, uh, and the bulkiness of the CAT 7 cable, does that present a, uh, a termination issue if you were using a 6A type connector? Uh, I, I, it does not for the um, the chassis side. I mean, certainly when you uh, uh, terminate it with an RG45, you're perfectly fine. Um, I'm not aware of there being a problem with the uh, with the IDC termination style because when you're um, uh, each particular wire is is is, is within our range. Um, again, the bigger issue, the, the biggest issue where this comes up is with uh, Crestron compatibility. Uh, this is partially because Crestron uh, wants to ensure that their systems are working well, so they want to be sure that the that Customers are using good cable and not not crappy cable, uh, and we do have a whole chart of compatibility with Crestron cable, which uh, I'm happy to share. We published it a, 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 maybe a couple of years ago now. Um, anybody that wants that information can can contact uh, you at FTW or contact us here at Nordic USA, and, and we'll we'll provide that compatibility to you. So uh, I know it's it's widely used, but having said that, um, it, it really it seems to be overkill or or not yet. Uh, in place in our AV industry, we we don't we don't see a lot of it, other than in that um, uh, that uh, Crestron kind of area. Uh, we we may see more in the future, and and that may also be dependent a little bit upon whether it can be a um, a profit maker for the companies Crestron, AMX, etc., which are selling systems and want to sell the associated cable. Yep, that makes sense, and uh, we run in, we run into it a lot here with uh, Kramer. Uh, Kramer also has a lot of their uh, uh, HD based T product that uh, specifies the uh, individually shielded Cat Seven cable. Okay, Very good. yeah, that makes sense. Right. Good. And Fred, right, well, uh, did me, you have um, some more presentation you wanted to move on with at this point? Then that's what I've got for questions so far. Uh, let me do it. I've got a couple minutes, and I'll take them. So we've talked a lot about Ethercom, but let me just talk about some alternatives to this. Um, the first alternative that we offer, which is much more expensive, is optical con. It's a fiber optic system. Um, there are many advantages to fiber optics. Probably the greatest is if you need to break past that 100 meter barrier that you have with copper, if you just need to go farther, then you can do it with fiber optics. Uh, and then also, we have up to 24 strands of fiber optics in the D size. So if you need to, to transmit a lot of data or a lot of disparate data streams, uh, optical con is, is a good solution for you to look at. You'll pay for it. Um, but you'll you'll get good performance um, and response as well. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of different multimedia connectors. Uh, we have this new line called MediaCon, which is USB uh, Type C, but this is only printed circuit board mount. Uh, we can't do it as a feed through because if we did, we would just wipe out performance. So that's not really going to help. Um, and some D subs and FireWire our HDMI line uh, does very well for us. Our USB 2 and USB 3 lines do well as, uh, as well. So I'll I'll stop at this point, but I I do want you to remember that. You know, if you're if you're trying to move some data from one place around to another, we we've got uh, we think lots of good options for you in the in the digitized world. So let me stop and say thank you to everybody. I really appreciate your taking the time. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'd love to talk about this stuff, and uh, and I'm here to help. I know it's a um, it, it's it's an extensive line, and so um, 
rely on your people at FDW and rely on me as well. Measure twice, cut once. You'll, you'll always be happier <laughs> in that way. Fred, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent resource. And, and, and uh, you know, for a topic that sounds very uh, cut and dried, yes, the the number of options, the number of uh, implications that come into connecting uh, different manufacturers' cables and, and all that, yeah, I'm sure you do get a lot of technical support questions for what uh, outwardly would appear to be a very simple, uh, oh, you just plug it in. But it's it's not right. always that easy. Right. <laughs> And uh, exactly. Fred, I also want to thank you. The uh, the training that you provide uh, to our customers in this is also used as a uh, indoctrination, kind of a, a boot camp <laughs> for the uh, new salespeople we bring on board too, because we want them to be able to navigate the waters of interconnectability, uh, not only for Ethernet connectors, but as you say, for optical connectors and, and uh, analog audio and video connectors. And your company certainly uh, does all of those, and we appreciate the support. Uh, I definitely want. Oh, have we got one more question? I'm being signaled here. Just a minute. Take a look. Oh, nope, it is just a comment. Someone has appreciated your presentation today very much. So oh, uh, very glad for, for that as well. <laughs> but uh, but with that, I appreciate it as well. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you uh, have uh, enjoyed uh, this presentation and think it'd be useful for your coworkers, please remind them that they can access this on the FDW website. And uh, once again, the reminder about the uh, survey at the end as you check out, uh, if you have any comments to leave for us, we appreciate those. Uh, the survey helps us make better presentations and uh, certainly if you have topics for future ones, let us know that as well and we'll uh, endeavor to find a good presenter for those topics. Fred, thank you for joining us and I can't imagine there's going to be too many questions because you t covered the topic very thoroughly. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our webinar.